Hello, friends. I'm Paul White. Thank you for joining me and for listening to the sermons that we post here at Paul White Ministries. The message that you're about to hear is from the very first session from our November 2023 trip to the Netherlands. We did three sessions at a leader's gathering, about 25 or 30 pastors, uh, musicians, church leaders, executive pastors sitting in a room talking about Jesus. I was introduced, and I'm going to just take off in this sermon. I, I cut out my intro and the bio stuff, and I, th- this is a no translation, just native tongue, just me speaking my heart, and this group of people uh, was so gracious and wonderful. Um, if you like, like tight sermons that are outline driven, with uh, you know these things that flow perfectly one to the next, then this not this is not for you. <laughs> but if you like um, sharing from the heart and reading a text and seeing where God takes it, then you're going to enjoy this. I'm going to pick it up right at my opening. It's it's a little prayer statement I make over the group. And in it, I make mention of three things, and you'll need these as we get going, that we have three things in common. I make mention of those three things, and that is that we believe in the resurrected Christ, we all feel called to to do ministry, and that we will all suffer in one way or the other. These are the universal things I thought that was happening in that room. From there, we're off and running. And uh, I, I, I don't even have a I don't know that I even have an appropriate title for this. So, if you, as you noticed, uh, we titled this um, in, in that our opening session um, in the Netherlands, 2023, and I I hope it is a blessing to you. It blessed me listening back to it because it put me in the spirit of being in that room and in that space. This was a delightful, delightful day. Um, and over time, we will release all three of these sessions. I think they get better and better as the day goes along. So enjoy our opening session from our trip to the Netherlands 2023. And so I want to wash off my fellow believers in Jesus, leaders of his church, sufferers for the cause. I wash you with the water of the word today. I thank God for you. I pray blessing and favor and prosperity in what you do, that in the midst of your suffering, you do not lose sight of the resurrected Christ and the reason why you accepted the call, and that you know that you are not alone. I want to turn, if you have a Bible, go to Hebrews 13. I would like to share with you some things over the next few sessions as leaders that I try to, when I approach these meetings, I try to think, what would I want to hear if I were sitting in a room today with other pastors and someone was going to talk to me about pastoring or about leading? I don't need a salvation message. You know, I don't need to, I don't want the finer points of their theology. I want to know something I can take away as a leader that's sourced in the word, that's about that Jesus that might do me some good in what I'm doing and might give, me a, might give me an insight, might give me some help in my journey. And so that's what I'm attempting to do today. I'm a lover of the Bible. I, um, like all of you, I read it and study it and enjoy it and I'm passionate about sharing it. I also know that we can spend so much time with our face down in the text and working on the Greek and working on what this word means and stands for that we don't get practical when it comes to leading people. And so there's a danger in being a good Bible student and also being a pastor. Uh, And that danger is that you expect everybody to be good Bible students. How many of you have found in pastoring that most of your church people don't care about being good Bible students? (laughs) Many of them don't even bring their Bibles. So they rely on you to read a few verses and then expound and then give them something practical for life. So being a good Bible student doesn't make us good pastors, that's for sure. Uh, It helps to know Bible. Uh, and it's a necessary part of who we are if we're going to understand what we do. But So I'm not going to try to give you a Greek. We're not going to conjugate Greek verbs and, and work on to- translating every word out, laying them out piece by piece. Uh, we'll see the Greek here and there and talk a little bit about that. But really, I want to share some things that I feel like might help you in your journey as under-shepherds, because that's what we are, right? We're 
under shepherds of the great shepherd. Look at verse 7 from Hebrews 13. And really, this is the concluding passage of a book that is written to Hebrew Christians, meaning Jews who have accepted Christ as their Messiah in the first century A.D. in a world full of Roman occupation, dispersed Jews across most of the Roman Empire. And now we're probably less than a decade by the time Hebrews is written, less than a decade from the fall of the temple in Jerusalem. And the Judaism that all of these knew their entire life is about to end. For all intents and purposes, we're less than 10 years from the last animal sacrifice, less than 10 years from the last waving of the incense in the temple, less than 10 years from the last day of atonement behind that great curtain of the most holy place. And this is a group of people who've only known Moses. They've only known the law. They've only known religion and Judaism with all of its literally all of its bells and whistles. It's a sight, sound, smell, touch-based faith. You, it's a temple you can touch. It's incense you can smell. It's the bleating of dying lambs you can hear. This is a very visceral part of first century Judaism. When you walk into Jerusalem, the temple is the dominant feature in the, in the world of the first century. The sights, the smells, and the sounds of that temple are overwhelming. How many of you know the smell of something can take you back to your childhood? The sight of something connects you to something you forgot about from 20 years ago. And you see it again and think, I'm, I'm a kid again. Imagine that being the core of your religious experience. Now imagine that you've heard of Jesus, that resurrected Christ, and you believe in him. You believe he's alive and you've placed your faith in him as your Messiah. But you know he's not, you don't merely believe he's your Messiah. One of the things from a moment ago when I told you we're all universally connected in this room because we believe in resurrected Jesus, but one of the underpinnings of that is that we believe that he's resurrected whether anyone else believes it or not. Like it's not just an individual thing. I don't walk, I don't say to you, uh, do you believe in a resurrected Jesus? And you say to me, yes, but it's okay if you don't because, you know, it's, it's all just your own personal faith. The truth is, is that we do believe in that resurrected Jesus as a reality for everyone. Now imagine that that's your faith and it's A.D. 65 and you believe in this resurrected Jesus and that he matters and that he's Messiah and that you enter Jerusalem and you smell the incense and you hear the bleating lamb, and you see the shiny gold off the side of the temple as the sun hits it, and you are drawn back into everything about that Jewish faith and that Jewish heritage. Um, Everything in you in that season is pulled into what you used to be, Um, pulled back to Moses, pulled back to Judaism, pulled back to the law. And it's very difficult to lay all of that down and accept an invisible Jesus whom you don't touch, you don't smell, you don't hear, you don't taste. And Hebrews is a book saying... Jesus is greater than Moses. Jesus is greater than the law. Jesus is greater than the temple. Jesus is greater than the sacrifice. If you read Hebrews, the overarching, I like to see Hebrews as this ascending message. It's heading up to the top of this mountain of information. And you get, you you finally arrive in, in Hebrews 11 and he says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Why now faith is the substance? Because in your entire Jewish experience, what you could touch, what you could smell, what you could taste, what you could hear, all of that was the substance of your belief. And in Christ, you got rid of all of that and substituted it with the internalization of your identity. 
It's not just that I'm from the tribe of or circumcised the eighth day. It's now that I have accepted this one whom I do not encounter by touch and smell and hearing and sight, but I encounter by faith. Now faith is the only thing that I have left. Now imagine pastoring people in that environment whose entire experience was physical and auditory and sight-based and smell. And they're coming to Jesus and you're giving them faith as the substance of things I hope for. How do you lead in that environment without people wanting to go back? How do you lead in an environment where all they've ever known are the natural and now you're giving them the spiritual and they keep wanting to marry the spiritual with the natural? Why wouldn't they? Think about it. Put put yourself in that man's shoes in the first century and you walk into Jerusalem and you hear the lambs bleating and you smell the incense and you know you have Jesus inside, but you think, what would it hurt? What would it hurt to pull out the money pouch and purchase a lamb? It'll connect me to my ancestors. And take that lamb and offer it up as a burnt offering. It's just hedging my bets. Yes, I believe in Jesus, but, you know, I've believed in those dead lambs for a long time, too. What would that hurt to put those together? To marry the two things that have mattered the most in my religious experience. And the author of Hebrews keeps saying, there's nothing to go back to. He says to go back to that, you'd have to trot across the blood of Jesus afresh to go back to Moses. You would have to do insult to the spirit of grace, he says in the book of Hebrews, to go back to the things that you used to do, to marry the concepts of your religious salvation with the concept of your faith in Christ, to put those two together, to try to make them compatible. He says, you can't be done. And that seems out of our purview because we don't have dead lambs and we don't have a temple with natural incense, and we don't have, but we do have performance. And we do have my natural ability to do good and my sense of guilt when I do wrong. And we do have, if I were to read more chapters or pray a little longer or give a little more, then maybe God would do for me all of the things that God has promised. And we've had that for so long that you are pastoring environments where people are very much in tune with believing for a God who blesses the natural things, who blesses us for doing the natural things and gives us spiritual blessings as a result of them. So you don't have churches full of people who have killed lambs and smelled the incense and watched the sun dazzle the side of the temple, but you do have churches full of people who believe that God will bless them if they give more, that God might keep them from injury if they had a better prayer life, that God might not work against them so much if they attended church a little more regularly, And you're going to be tempted as leaders that when it gets difficult to see change in your people's lives, the temptation is going to be to lean back into those natural things and begin to preach to them how if they don't read and if they don't pray and if they don't give and if they don't attend, this might happen and this might happen and this might happen. And you might even know better, but it's going to be awfully easy to lean into that style of leadership in order to get people to follow the invisible Jesus. That's the book of Hebrews up to where we are. We haven't read anything, I know. (laughs) There's a lot of quoting to get you there. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. Remember those who rule over you. I told you we won't do a lot of Greek. We will right here. The word rule is not very good. And some of your translations probably use the word lead or pastor. That's a much better word from the Greek because it's not a ruler as in the negative connotation of empirical rule but as in shepherding, leading by shepherding. Remember those who shepherd you, who rule over you, who lead you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Uh, The word there is an addition to your translation. So we're considering the outcome of conduct. We're not necessarily talking about the conduct of the leader, but we're considering that there is an outcome of our conduct as we follow our leaders. This Hebrews 13, 7 is really a verse about leadership within the church structure in which we're leading a people. Remember, we're talking to Hebrews. 
We're leading a people out of performance-based physical substance religion and into the invisibleness of faith and following the, the, the Christ whom you believe by faith, born again of the Spirit. It doesn't mean we don't have physical sacrament. We have the body, we have the blood, we have water baptism. We have the sounds of worship, but we don't place our faith in them as the source of our salvation. We are trusting in the Christ we don't see. So the role then of leaders, Hebrews says, remember those who are over you. Now, watch as it feels like a bit of a diversion in the text, but it's not. These all flow together, and I want to flow through them with the author. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines, for it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those which have been occupied with them. I'll stop here for a moment and point out that leaders are, we're watching our leaders, and so in this case, we know that leaders are in this room, but this is a verse being spoken about for all of us as we lead the people in one way or the other. We're considering the outcome of conduct and then immediately are told that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and we're warned not to be carried about with various and strange doctrines. It says to me that part of leadership is recognizing the constancy of Jesus. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, and not allowing strange doctrines to carry us away from that. These are the kind of verses that actually block people from letting the Holy Spirit teach them anything because they're scared that if what they hear is a little different than what they knew, then now they're listening to a strange doctrine. And so they don't want to get involved in anything that didn't remind them of what they were a week ago or six months ago or a year ago because that's a strange doctrine. I can't follow that. But I want you to notice that you've been told exactly the doctrine that leadership is to adhere to to bring the outcome of our conduct where we want it to be. It's Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's not what I believe. It's in whom I believe. He has not changed. Jesus Christ is the same today as He was in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He will be that Jesus forever. A strange doctrine is anything that changes that Jesus. It's not anything that changes your mind. You see, you you have the core of who you believe. That's the same, Jesus Christ, yesterday, today, and forever. But what you believe shifts. How many of you have had anything shift about what you believe about Jesus? I have. Christ hasn't changed. What I think of Christ has changed. Christ hasn't changed, but what I think of Christ Various things about the church or the word have changed. And thus Jesus Christ becomes the centerpiece of my doctrine. My doctrine can shift on the edges of what I believe. But Jesus Christ is the the centric, this is Christocentric theology, where Christ is the centerpiece and everything else must be a subsidiary off of Jesus or it's a strange doctrine. Wherever it is not, wherever it does not lead me back to the centrality of Christ is a various and strange doctrine that's led me away from the centrality of Christ and into something else. So if you will stay centered on the same one yesterday, today, and forever, that will even inter- help you to interpret the scriptures, which are over all of our heads in most cases. We, we're dealing with texts that in some cases are 4,500 years old in concept. Um, at at minimum 2,000 years old and when it was penned. Penned in languages we don't speak. Hebrew, Chaldean, Greek, written first and spoken in Aramaic. I mean, think about this from Jesus. He's speaking Aramaic to a Hebrew audience that write it down in Greek and translate it into Latin. (laughs) And it stays there for 1,450 years before anybody translates it into anything. Anything else. And then it takes centuries to squeeze it from that language to a language anyone can understand. And now we're sitting in the church fighting about new translations. Like that's a new thing. We've been doing this as long as we can do this. Trying to get to the bottom of the text. And so you're going to get in arguments and fights and disagreements about the text. But the Jesus Christ... 
the same yesterday, today, and forever, has to remain the centerpiece of who we are. And if he remains the centerpiece, it'll even help you to interpret the Bible around him. So that when you read stories and you're back here in the Old Testament and you're in a story and God looks rough, can we be honest and say that there are some Old Testament stories where God looks rough? And you've got God going into the new land and I want you to kill everyone men, women, and children, and leave nothing behind. And that one's a tough one to teach your five-year-old Sunday school class, right? Hello, little kids. I want to introduce all of you to a Bible story today. Now, if you were studying your lesson before you got to church and you realized that your lesson was kill the men, women, and children, you'd probably spend Saturday night praying about, how am I supposed to filter this to little five-year-old Johnny? What do I say about the God that orders the mass genocide of an entire generation of kids? Now, if you don't think that's a real issue, well, you haven't paid attention to the Bible. Or you're not taking this serious. Or you're just saying this lazy answer, which is, well, there's just a bunch of stuff in there we don't understand. Just trust God. If he said kill kids, he meant kill kids. Because if that's what you raise, then you have a generation of people that goes, well, if it makes sense to me, then it'll be okay to be genocidal or violent or murderous. If it makes sense to my cause, then I can do whatever I have to do to bring the good to my people. If that means killing other people. Guys, we got a world full of that already. we got a world full of people that say, if it makes sense to my cause and I have to kill, well then, you know, it's for the greater good if someone else has to die. So how do we filter that? Jesus Christ. The same yesterday, today, and forever. I had a man use that story on me recently and said, well, you know, the Bible's full of God telling people to kill people. And I said, you're right. The Bible is full of God telling people to kill people. Thank you. I said, but how many does Jesus tell you to kill? And he said, well, to be honest, I can't think of any. And I said, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, today, And forever, Jesus is who you're a disciple of. You're not a disciple of the Bible. You're not a disciple of Moses. You're not a disciple of the Apostle Paul. You're a disciple of Jesus. Jesus Christ is the centerpiece for how you translate the Bible, for how you interpret the story. So you go, well, what, Pastor, what would you do with that genocidal story? I would say that people have been misunderstanding God for a long time, and then Jesus came. And when Jesus walked onto the scene, they misunderstood him too. And Jesus spends his life and ministry overcoming misunderstandings and expectations. And at every turn, Jesus is forgiving and merciful and loving and lifts the load instead of puts it on. At every time he's opening his mouth, he's addressing women and Samaritans and strangers and outsiders and tax collectors and Gentiles, and Roman centurions, and all the wrong people. It's as if he decides to go check all of the boxes and include all of the people that have been excluded, even through the Scriptures, all the way up to him. And he's multiplying fish for the poor and the hungry, and he's walking on the water, and he's turning the water to wine. He's healing the sick, and he's raising the dead, and he's showing compassion, and ultimately he steps into the violence of the sword, and he acquiesces to it, and he lets it kill him. And he invites us to come and follow him into this. And when our instinct is to take the sword and cut people's heads off, because that's what you do in defense of the right, he holds his hand up and says, permit even this. If you live by this sword, you're going to die by this sword. Come follow me. Into the way, the way that is death, the way that is not easy, the way of suffering. And so Jesus Christ becomes our centerpiece of interpretation. It's how we figure out these stories. You know, we all, there's a campaign of what would Jesus do? It's, I I think in a lot of cases, it was meant to be a statement of how would Jesus love this person or would Jesus forgive this person? How would he talk to this person? Um, It's not a bad campaign in regards to what, what did Jesus do when faced with the exact situations that we're putting him into the middle of now? co-opting him and claiming him. 
he would say this, he would do this. But what did he do? How, how did he live this out? The Jesus you see there is the Jesus we present now. And so the beauty of it is because he doesn't change, it doesn't matter what changes around us. We can go back to Jesus as the centerpiece of our faith to say, how did Jesus handle these exact situations in his day? He is the timeless one. He is who we follow. I want to follow up on one thing we said there, um, that Jesus stepped into the world and then started changing the expectations. I want you to know that this was not easy in Jesus' day, any easier than it is now. You're going to have to be ever vigilant as pastors to present this centerpiece of Jesus in your faith. This is why you can't preach Jesus too much to your people. You literally can't preach Jesus too much. If someone says to you, all you preach around here is Jesus, take that as the great compliment. In fact, preach it until someone accuses you of that. That, I I, I mean it. Preach Jesus so much that people go, when are we going to hear some Paul? When are we going to get some James? Is there any John coming up? Why is it always Jesus? Praise God. Jesus Christ is the centerpiece of our faith. If you think I'm overdoing it with Jesus, then we're just getting started. Jesus Christ is my salvation, nothing else. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and forever. He had to be ever vigilant. Because he entered a world in which their expectations of him were vastly different than what he delivered. For instance, and I don't know, I don't want to say too much about this because I've got this in mind. We might talk about this a little later today. But um, on the road to Emmaus, remember, the two disciples are walking with Jesus. They're blinded. We are going to talk about the blinding tomorrow in the conference. But one thing that is worth saying here is they say to Jesus, whom they don't recognize, their eyes are blinded. And they say, haven't you heard about what happened in Jerusalem this weekend? Jesus of Nazareth was crucified. We thought he would be the one who redeemed Israel. I've always considered that one of the saddest statements in the Gospels. They say to Jesus, we thought he would be the one who would redeem Israel. In other words, they're disappointed. They're not just disappointed he died. They're disappointed he didn't do what they thought he would do. He did do what they thought he would do. But they didn't recognize it even in their time. So don't be shocked if people struggle with a gospel that is just Jesus. In fact, a lot of people will reject you if you give them a gospel that is just Jesus. Because we're so used to the sights and the sounds and the smells of what we came out of that we constantly want to marry it to the Jesus that is pure. And we want to so badly that purely Jesus seems like it's not enough. In a world of missiles and bombs and violence, purely Jesus isn't enough. They'll even say to you, this isn't realistic. It's not realistic for you to present the Sermon on the Mount to me, a 2,000-year-old argument from a shepherd on a hill outside of Judea, as the answer for what I'm to do in the face of the conflict of the world. And it just shows us how disappointed we still are with Jesus. Another example, in John 14, Jesus tells his disciples, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Dad's house are many rooms. I'm going to go away, prepare one for you. When I'm done preparing, I'm going to come again and receive you to myself. That where I am there, you may be also, right? Famous passage, which I don't believe has anything to do with the return of Jesus. Mm -hmm. I think it has to do with the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus goes into the tomb, three days later comes out, having already prepared a space for you in the kingdom. So when you accept Jesus, he accelerates you into the presence of his father because you can sit in dad's house. Whomever loves my father, my father and I love him, and they make their abode in him. And so that's the same word as mansion from your old King James. My, in my father's house are many mansions. It's rooms. And then deeper in the chapter, that room is in you, and me and dad live there. Okay, so that was right there. Okay, that's beautiful to us, right? His disciples raise their hand and go, that's all good, but can you just show us the father? <laughs> it's John chapter 14. Philip goes, just, just show us the Father. And I think Jesus goes, oh. <laughs> you know, I think it's just like, but his response is, how long would I have to be with you before you would realize that if you see me, you've seen the Father? That's the gold question in the Bible, right there. How long would it take for me to convince you that if you look at Jesus, you're looking at God. 
How long would it take? How many sermons would I have to preach on Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, the centrality of Christ, the centerpiece of your faith, before you would get it that the God of judges is Jesus? And that if the God of judges doesn't look like Jesus, you're reading the God of judges wrong. Because Jesus is why you're here, not the God of judges. You're not here because God spoke to Moses at Sinai. You're here because God died on a cross and raised from the dead. When we started today with our universal connection as a resurrected Jesus, no one raised their hand with me and objected and said, no, it's the Ten Commandments. (laughs) Like you got into this because you like ten rules written on rocks and that's how you want to live your life? No, you believe Jesus is alive. You place your faith in this. You're willing to die for this. You're pastoring churches for this. You're leading God's children towards home for that fact. Not because you believe there's 10 rules on rocks, but because he's alive. He's really alive, and he looks like daddy. And if I want to know what God looks like, all i got to do is look at Jesus. And if I could see it in Jesus, then I can claim it in the Father. And if I can't see it in Jesus, don't blame it on the Father. If I can't see it in Jesus, stop saying God did it. Because if Jesus didn't do it, I can't accuse the Father and the Son of acting like two different people. Even his disciples thought that. So don't be upset with your church. Don't be upset with yourself because you're going to slide into it because you read the Bible through sight and sound and touch and smell for a long, long time. You are the book of Hebrews. We are. We just, it was, that was what we experienced. And then we got the invisible... God manifested in a resurrected Christ in us and went, oh, no, a lot of stuff I thought wasn't right. A lot of stuff I believed about. But what's the difference in that and the strange doctrines you're scared of being blown around with now? Well, the difference is Jesus Christ. The same yesterday, today, and forever. And so Jesus Christ becomes the centerpiece, and that helps me to determine where the wind is blowing and all those other doctrines. Does this lead me to Jesus? Well, not really. Okay, I'm, I'm going to leave it alone. Does the Jesus that lead me to look like the Jesus of the Bible? Well, maybe, but it looks a little more, more like the God of judges. Okay. No. Jesus Christ alone. See, this is going to be difficult because here's Jesus walking and talking with the disciples, and they raise their hand and go, show us the Father. And I kidded and said, Jesus hangs his head. I don't think he does. But he, he, maybe in his spirit, he goes, oh, how long i got to be with you? Because their expectations were not being met in Jesus. This is hard for me to, to fathom. I, I really, I, it really is hard for me to fathom. And I try not to be judgmental of Peter, James, and John. I try not to be judgmental of Thomas and Bartholomew and... Nate and all of them. Um, and, and what I mean by that is I want to think that I would have recognized, I would get it, you know, like if I'm there, because I know I'm so smart. <laughs> that was sarcasm in case you didn't recognize. You know, like I would have got it. Like I would recognize what Jesus is up to because he's, he's love embodied. But I'm bringing my faith And my experience with a new covenant understanding of Jesus, I'm bringing that into my reading of the text. And that's dangerous to try and understand how they thought. Because the Jesus that they expected would look a whole lot more like Judas Maccabees of the intertestamental period that takes up the hammer and beats up the oppressors and delivers Israel from the oppression. And so all they see is the iron fist of the Roman Empire. And they truly believe that if they ever get their Messiah, he will snap the wrist of the Roman Empire and crush the hammer to powder and bring the kingdom back to God. So they have a kingdom message in the Gospels. But their kingdom message is we're supposed to destroy the kingdom of this earth and lift up the kingdom of God. And the Messiah is going to bring us into that kingdom. And the only way they knew how to determine that happens is how kingdoms rise and fall. Kingdoms fall at the end of swords. And so for them, they kept waiting on a Messiah who had a sword. They kept waiting on a Messiah who brought them into this era of militant rebellion. I think they thought they got it at Gethsemane. When right before they go into Gethsemane, Jesus says, 
if you have two cloaks, sell one and buy a sword. And I think they all went, here we go. This is a moment. This is what we've been waiting for. And so they bought, they get two. And Peter goes, we've got two swords. And Jesus goes, that's enough. And the text says that he did this so that the scripture would be fulfilled that he was numbered with the transgressors. A lot of us think that numbering him with the transgressors was hanging at Calvary. But according to the Gospels, numbering him with the transgressors was because he had two swords in his group. And under Roman law, if a group of men were found with two swords, they could be held as insurrectionists. And so Jesus numbers himself with the insurrectionists and walks into the garden. And the first moment they get a chance to use it, they do. And that's when Jesus says, put your sword up. Permit even this. And the reality is, is that Jesus wants to show you, it's one thing to talk about how you don't believe in swinging swords. You're a nonviolent person. Well, bless your heart. Maybe you're nonviolent because you don't have any strength. So it's easy to be apathetic when you don't have any other possibility. But what if you had the sword? Are you apathetic now? See, it's easy when you're not in power to feel like power's the problem. When you don't have the strength to hurt anyone, you're naturally nonviolent because you hope everybody will leave you alone. But what about when you have the bombs and you have the guns and you have the sword or you have the pulpit? What about when it's your chance and that's when you find out what you're made of? So in the garden, Peter pulls his sword and cuts Malchus' servant's ear off and Jesus has put the sword up. Permit even this. If you live by it, you die by it. In other words, I only had you bring it in here to teach you how not to use it. Because you can sit around all day long talking about how God is peaceful and loving when you don't have any power. But the second you get some, you find out how non-peaceful and non-loving he is. Because what we really want is the good guys to have the sword. And that's why they were disappointed with Jesus. Because they kept waiting for the good guy to pick up the sword And he wouldn't, not even when they cornered him, not even when they cornered him with swords in the garden, not even when it was the right moment. Even then, he just stepped into death. And that's why they raised their hand and go, show us the Father. This can't be what God looks like. And Jesus says, how long would we have to do this before you'd get it? That this is exactly what the Father looks like. Now, how do we, what what do we get all this out of Hebrews 13? Well, the truth is, is we didn't get all this out of Hebrews 13. But what we did do is start the road of saying, pray for your leaders. They have a message. It's Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And don't be carried about with strange doctrines. What would the strange doctrine be? Anything that's not Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Anything where Jesus that you're propping up today doesn't look like the Jesus that was propped up in the gospel. In the land that I come from, my heritage of Christianity is very much changing the image of Jesus into a Jesus who is sometimes violent in the, for the sake of good or who uses power because they think power is the means of, is what God would do. If God were given power, how would God use it? And it's, it's a fundamental misunderstanding of the kingdom of God versus the kingdoms of this world. Let me show you what I mean. In the middle of verse 9, It's good that the heart be established by grace. And then the author goes into something that sounds very Jewish, very, sounds kind of ancient for us. So let's try to figure out why. It's good your heart be established by grace and not with food, which have not profited those who've been occupied with him. Because in the Jewish culture, food was the great separator between what made you Jewish and what did not. And so what you put into your body was indicative of the temple of God on the earth being manifest as your body. And so what you put in it would be the equivalent of you wouldn't take a pig into the temple to sacrifice it. Thus, you wouldn't put it into your... So whatever wasn't sacrificial, that was one of your first cues on what should and should not go into your body. Well, then comes Christianity, and Paul comes along and says the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So the point of that, to try and push back against dietary restriction was not because they just wanted to eat bacon. And maybe they didn't at all. That was a big conflict in the early church, whether it was okay to eat whatever. 
The point in pushing back against it was to establish that the kingdom of God is not in the realm of the natural. The kingdom of God is in the realm of the spiritual. So to try and put the kingdom of God into the realm of the natural, you would do natural things. Paul called it touch not, taste not, handle not. To the Corinthians, he said, why would you go back under a system of touch not, taste not, handle not? Everything they're telling you not to touch, taste, and handle perishes with the using. He goes, so why would you go back to a system of don'ts when the kingdom isn't built up of what you can touch? Okay, that's the hint right there that the kingdom doesn't look like this kingdom. So if the kingdom isn't meat and drink, it's also not swords and guns. You get that? That's the point. Because for them, meat and drink was the very symbol of natural kingdoms and the very symbol of their temple. Some stuff doesn't belong in the temple of God, therefore some stuff doesn't belong in us. That was the the mindset. So if you're going to remove, when you're removing the dietary restriction, you're not doing it just to let you eat whatever. Fine, if you want to. There is no Christian restriction on it. He goes, but the point is, is that it's no longer about the natural because the kingdom of God is no longer about the natural. The reason why we don't get Jesus is because we're natural thinking people. Because we're, we're citizens of our nation. We're citizens of our race. We're products of our culture. And all of that comes with baggage. And we think that if we accept Jesus, what we're doing is just inviting Him into that space so that that space can be elevated. So that what happens is Jesus comes into my nation, my culture, my tongue, my gender, my, and he just picks it up. And this is such a secular idea because you could, be a, you could be a self-help guru and preach that to your church. You could bring a self-help guru into your church who goes, wherever you want, we want to elevate you into a better space. And you go, hey man, praise God, that's good. You don't need Jesus to elevate people's mentality about where they are. Christ isn't offering them a better thing than they have, like what they have on steroids. Christ is coming in with a brand new kingdom. And so Christ comes in and goes, it's not going to look like what you came out of. It's not going to taste like it. It's not going to smell like it. It's not going to sound like it. Because it doesn't exist in the same realm in which you exist. So the answers and the solutions are not going to be the same answers and solutions. And that's why we raise our hand and we go, Just show us the Father. And Jesus goes, how long do you need to see me work before you realize that the Father turns the other cheek? The Father loves his enemy. The Father elevates, the, he takes care of the poor and the stranger. The Father doesn't pick up the sword and retaliate. How long do you need to watch me do this before you realize I don't do it like Caesar? I don't do it like the kingdoms of this world. The opposite are hearts established in grace, verse 9. And the great challenge of us as pastors is to establish the people in our church on the grace of God and not on the strength of the pastor, not on the theological intelligence of the leadership team, not on the skills we acquired at the recent leadership conference with so-and-so for that weekend, but a heart established in the grace of God. And the temptation is going to be to establish people on good theology. Establish people on sound teaching. Establish people on, and this one, this one doesn't strike us grace people the same anymore, but it's still there. Establish people on good works. Establish people on performance. Establish people on moral code. But Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, asks us to establish people in grace. Why does he do that? To to get to this, sometimes you got to go backwards to go forward. So go back in Hebrews to Hebrews 12. I want to show you how 12 dovetails into 13 because the translators broke this up. The writer didn't. So the writer's just in the same thought he was in in 12. He didn't know they were going to put this in a different chapter. (laughs) You know, sometimes the Bible, I'm reading the Bible and I go, oh, If you guys would have broke this chapter one verse later, that would have really helped. Or one verse earlier, that would have really helped. Uh, Here's a moment, I think, when that might have helped. Um, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 27. Yet once more indicates the removal of the things that are being shaken as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. Whatever's made, whatever is touch, taste, handle, Smell, sight, hearing, whatever's in the natural 
is made. So whatever's in the natural can be shaken, right? Confidence can be shaken, nations can be shaken, kingdoms can topple, ideologies can fall, power structures go down, leaders go to everything you can touch is going away. But there's things that can't be shaken. 28, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear for our God is a consuming fire. The consuming fire is actively taking care of whatever can be shaken, actively burning up whatever in me is made and not created in the image of God. And we need to have grace in that because people are on a journey of letting go of the things that can be shaken. This is what your parishioners are doing in church is they're letting go of the things that can be shaken. And how we do it is not smacking them and forcing their hands open to let them go and slap their hand. But with grace, because only with grace will they grow into the knowledge of who they are in Christ enough to let go of the things they need to let go of. This takes a patience that's not natural. It takes a patience that's from another kingdom. Because our natural patience wants people to change and we'll do whatever we got to do to get it done. And we'll even validate whether or not we're doing the right thing by how many people are living right or whether or not people are seen in public acting right. Or This is tough. It's tough to get out of the space of validating whether you're a good pastor based on how big your church is, whether you're a good pastor based on how the people are living. Difficult. And even, even if you give yourself that grace, you often won't give that grace to your other pastors. Because then when you see so-and-so goes to brother so-and-so's church, you go, yeah, of course he does. Of course he does. I mean, now look at how he lives. Even we grace people are guilty of that. Because, oh, yeah, well, I know where they go to church. I know what they're hearing. We immediately revert back to theology and instruction rather than the grace of God. And then if you're in the middle of a kingdom that can be shaken... And your whole life can be shaken. You're going to need grace. Because you're going to try to, sh- to knock some things down that can't be knocked down. And you're going to try to hold on to some things that need to go. And how are you going to know the difference? God's a consuming fire. So it's, the, it's us entering into the furnace of His love that's going to expose whatever about us is the lie so that whatever about us is true can stand because it's part of the kingdom of God. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And a list of other things that are invisible, but they're all in Christ. They look like Jesus. Well, how are we going to know what they are? we got to watch Jesus. We have to watch Jesus. Because if we watch Jesus, He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. We won't be carried about with strange doctrines that don't take us to Jesus. And we need to go to Jesus because we got to establish people's hearts in grace. Why do we got to establish people's hearts in grace? Because they're in a kingdom that's not going anywhere. In a world that is going somewhere. Everything in their life is vanishing away, and you're introducing them to a Jesus that doesn't. And all they've ever known is the temple. All they ever have been are Hebrews. And so you're calling them Jesus alone, Jesus alone, Jesus alone. And it's going to take grace as they come kicking and screaming (laughs) into the reality of the kingdom of God. Mm. Holding on to the stuff that's all around them. That's easy to hold on. That's hard to let go of. Back to the Hebrews 13. We're trying to get to the end of this. <laughs> Middle of the verse, it's good that your heart be established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those who've been occupied. Because we have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. This is the great way to land the Hebrews plane. This guy's been writing, whoever he or she is, has been writing this book to try and bring Christians Hebrew Christians into the faith of Christ alone. So he goes back to grab the thing that, that's tripping them up, temples and altars and burnt sacrifice. He goes, you want an altar? You have one. We have an altar from which those who eat, serve the tabernacle don't have right to eat. The bodies of those animals whose blood's brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin, he burns them outside the camp. Well, guess what? Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, he suffered outside the gate. He's pointing to the cross. He's saying, this has already been done. You don't need to go back into a temple to offer up a sacrifice. We have our Jesus who was offered as a sacrifice. And he was offered in the space where they take the guts. Because you you gut the animal in the temple. And you take the guts outside. And the author of Hebrews goes, our Jesus went out with the guts. He went out with the refuse. He went out with the trash. To die in the trash. 
to die amongst us in our worst place, to take into Himself the worst of us. Therefore, let's go forth to Him outside the camp and bear His reproach. What are we unified by? You believe in resurrected Jesus. What else? You feel called to do what you're doing. What's the third thing? We suffer. You're invited to it right here. He says, so come here. Let's come here to the place where there is reproach. You just walk, walk into the place where there is suffering. You're going to suffer anyway. Wouldn't it be better to suffer in him, with him, where there is a consuming fire? Where whatever isn't real about you, and I want to tell you, you are loved, you are called, you're precious in the eyes of the Father, you are His righteousness. But whatever is in you that isn't real, whatever in you is still a little bit of the lie, it's not who you really are, and you have some, so do I. That is meeting the fire of the grace of God every time you encounter who he is so that the fire of the grace of God consumes what isn't real about you and that you let it go. We are all going to meet him in the realm of the spirit without the baggage of the natural. This thing's going away. This is my kingdom that shakes. But I have an unshakable kingdom living inside of me. So do you. And you're going to step into the fullness of that kingdom when this tent's gone. This is how New Testament writers talk about it. When this tent's gone, then you're going to step into the fullness of that spirit. And Paul says, when you do, you will take account for what you did with the foundation stone. The foundation stone is Christ. What you did with Christ is you built either with gold, silver, and precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble. How many of you know you've actually built with all of them? You know why there are six of them? Six was a good Hebrew number for humanity. Seven was God's completion, but six was man. Paul picked six things. Probably about half of what you do stands, and about half of what you do stinks. The wisdom is to know that you're not all good. All right? Wisdom's not spotting what's wrong with you. Wisdom's spotting the fact that you're not all good. I mean, you, like, like it's because it's hard, especially in grace. You go, well, you're all good. God sees nothing bad in you. You're the righteousness of God in Christ. And you are all of those things and still building with wood, hay, and stubble here and there. And when you get into the presence of the consuming fire, which starts now, can start now. This is what we're doing. This is why we're presenting people with Jesus Christ the same yesterday and day and forever because he's inviting you in. And whatever can burn will burn, Paul says. That which is wood, hay, and stubble will burn up. But even his soul shall be saved by fire. I love that. So we'll step into the furnace and whatever's gold, silver, and precious stones. Great. Whatever isn't, gone. By the one who baptizes you in fire. John says, I indeed baptize you with water. There is one coming who shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. His fan is in his hand, and he thoroughly purges his floor, and he separates the wheat from the chaff, and he burns the chaff with unquenchable fire, and he puts the wheat into the barn. He doesn't separate the wheat and the tares. That's a different story. Wheat and tares, tares are planted by the enemy. Wheat, the children of God, tares, the children of the devil. That's a different parable. The wheat and the chaff come from the same stalk. It's all you. The chaff just isn't good for anything. And the love of the grace of God, the Christ is blowing the fan into your heart to separate what's a lie about you from, from the truth about you. And he's in the business of burning up whatever's a lie about you. Let's participate in that when we present Jesus to our people. To say, I want to help today to burn whatever's not true about you. I want to help burn up whatever's a lie about you today. Not everything you're thinking about you is true. Not every action you're performing is the real you. Oh, you really performed it. <laughs> and you're really going to pay the consequences. How many of you know whether or not... I, listen, we can get into an argument about what God looks like in, in wrath, but I don't think we can argue too much that there are consequences to how we act. <laughs> right? I'm talking in this world. So if you want to go out there and do something, you're gonna, there's consequences. Either they're going to be from the law, or they're going to be from your neighbor, or they're going to be from your physical body. There's going to be something that happens. And those consequences we deal with, but we're talking about in the realm of the Spirit, that we know who we are in Christ, and the chaff burns up. We step into the fire, we step into it with Him. 
I didn't get as far in Hebrews 13 as I'd hoped, but we have more time today. So we'll come back to this. Let me stop right here with this. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever, He is one with His Father. So what you see of God in the Old Testament that looks like Jesus, you're seeing Jesus. Here's a good one. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are thrown into a fiery furnace that is seven times hotter than the furnace has ever been. That's the absolute perfection of chaos and disaster. Seven. It doesn't get hotter. This is as bad as it gets. And they're tied up and they're tossed in. And the king peers over and looks into the furnace and says, how many did we throw into the fire? And they say three. And he says, then why do I see four? And the fourth one looks like the son of God. What a moment in the book of Daniel. And you don't get anything out. That, they don't ever get interpret that in Daniel. It's not like they come out of the fire and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say, guess who's coming? <laughs> you know, you guys don't know. We've seen him. We don't get that. They don't go write a book on it. But what we do get is that when they come out of the fire, the text says that they came out without even the smell of smoke on them, and only that which bound them had burned up. Because when you step into the furnace of the love of God, you meet Jesus. That is the consuming fire of God. And he walks the furnace with you. And you don't have to worry because the only thing he's going to burn up is the chaff. The stuff that isn't really part of you and whatever it is that binds you. When we preach Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever as the, as the pastors and leaders of God, that's what we're preaching. Fourth man in the fire theology. He's still in the fire. Your body, your soul, and your spirit, and the fourth man in the fire. And you're, he, if the fourth man's in the fire, it's okay to preach the fire. <laughs> I get asked from people, go, how do we preach the fire of God? Oh, let me tell you the way. Put the fourth man in the fire. Just invite them in. I got to think, I don't personally think they, they got in the furnace and they're wandering around in the heat and then they stumble up on this guy. I think when the gate opened to the furnace, there was a fourth man in the fire going, come on in. The water is perfect. Come on in. Much more I wanted to say today. We'll say it here in a little bit. I love these meetings because when we get past the, the formality and the uncomfortable, who's this guy? And I'm looking at you going, who are these people? We fall into this space that I've watched now. This is 30 years this year of ministry for me. You fall into this space where all you're talking to are God's kids. They're not a different race. They're not a different nationality. They're, not, they're just God's kids. And if you can connect at the point of the resurrected Jesus, heaven comes down. Jesus said two or three. I'll be like, what happens is we connect at the point of the resurrected Jesus. You feel it happen in the room. Father, I thank you for this session. I thank you that what started today as a very chaotic and difficult moment, I, I believe that in this room there has been a rally around your goodness and your grace and your love, and we're believing that goodness and grace and love is a reflection of what you're doing in our brother's body. And we thank you for what you put into your son, Peter, to plant in this space. I hope I've honored that today by planting goodness into the soil that he has furrowed, that he has prepared. And maybe we've just watered some stuff that has already been done. In any case, you're the one that gives the increase. So I thank you for whatever increase comes out of this meeting today. And I thank you for what's going to come out of these meetings as we proceed. And I love your, your leaders, your children, and I thank you for their churches and, their, and the work that they're doing. And I know that we are unified because we believe in a resurrected Jesus. We believe we are called, and we all know that we're going to suffer. So as they suffer, and I'm not praying that they don't, because suffering is very good for who we are in you. I'm not praying that they don't. I'm praying that as they suffer, they see the fourth man in the fire. And that they then refuse to preach another sermon without him in the middle of it. May that become the impetus for what we do in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Go ahead, Benny.